Welcome to the Metasploit Sprint demo meeting for May 16th. Uh, let's see. So, just a little chart show where we are with the, the, how the pull requests have been trending. Um, this is like for the last uh, four months, five months or so. Uh, you can see we've got a healthy influx of, of things coming in and things getting closed out. And now I'm going to show you a chart that's a lot less interesting looking, but still, you know, you can get some interesting, some data from these things, right? You can see that uh, open bugs is slowly trending down. Uh, not a lot of bouncing around there uh, since the beginning of the year. So, for what it's worth, I debated about showing that slide or not. Just to, not a heck with it, I'll show it. Um, top committers this last month, uh, you know, big thumbs up to a lot of the folks who are uh, helping make Metasploit uh, mo better. So, thank you. And uh, talk about things that landed. Um, we have the, the IIS uh, Forever Day. Uh, it gives you remote code execution. So that is now uh, available uh, in the uh, master branch. Um, also, the, the, we have a scanner for the Intel's AMT uh, authorization bypass, uh, also in master. So that's available. Uh, there's a Quest, Pri Quest Privilege Manager remote code execution in there as well. Cryptech, Cryptolog, uh, Command Injection, Multi-Platform Railgun Support, which is really cool because now you can run Railgun on Linux, and I think Brent might be showing that to us in a little bit. Um, we also had another Hardware Bridge uh, module added. This is a CAN bus uh, probe, uh, kind of acts as a fuzzer, uh, so Craig Smith uh, gave us that one. Uh, also, a uh, NCAT SSL reverse shell payload support, uh, nice, nice little addition there. And uh, uh, Lance hooked us up with a uh, a nice fix that allows you to use uh, an Ethernet or network interface name instead of the IP if you prefer an LHOS parameter if you want. Uh, it's kind of a nice thing. And uh, we've got the uh, official release of the 64 bit only Windows build uh, kicking out uh, this week. So, yay. Brent, did you have anything uh, you'd like to add to, to this list? No, um, actually, uh, actually, you know, I, I lied. I actually do have some things to add. Um, so uh, mm -hmm. something I, I point out is that, um, you know, some of these things come straight for our community. In fact, uh, a lot of them, we kind of have a lot, lot to sort of, you know, thank our community uh, contributors for, for, uh, for doing these things. Like I, I believe uh, the AMT bypass came as a result of uh, Will mentioning on the IRC channel, hey, uh, I wonder if anyone's working on this. And she's like, hey, sure, I'll crank it out, and you got to get it in like an hour. So uh, that was a pretty awesome uh, help for him. Um, it actually took, took us, I think, a, like a couple days to verify it just because we couldn't get AMT to work. Uh, I think I bricked maybe uh, two or three um, Intel <laughs> devices as a result of uh, testing this out. But it's actually uh, pretty amazingly scary. Um, with Intel AMT, uh, your system can actually be off. Um, and you can still basically take full control of the system. Um, not only does it work over Ethernet, but um, we verified it works over wireless as well. So basically your, your Intel device can be um, off, but still connect to a Wi-Fi network and still, um, and still basically be manageable, even over IPv6, which is uh, where a lot of people aren't really looking. Um, kind of another funny thing about the AMT, uh, it turns out the actual way that the bypass was done was simply by sending a blank password. Um, that was it. Um, and uh, you know, um, just the simplest things. Um, it's actually kind of kind of ironic um, that the uh, the maintainer for Intel AMT, uh, you can actually find his, some of his stuff on Twitter. Um, uh, he he famously said that uh, the closed source stuff is much better than open source because um, you know it's uh, much higher quality standards and that sort of thing. And the fact that a, a blank password got through for um, I don't know probably better part of a decade is, is pretty astonishing. So um, anyway, uh, if you got AMT, turn it off for sure. <laughs> Awesome. Thanks, Brent. Yeah, big shout out to all the community uh, contributions we have. It makes Metasploit really cool. A lot of good stuff we get. Um, things in the works. Uh, we have an Eternal Blue exploit um, that uh, I'll demo today if, if nobody else beats me to it. Um, a bunch of WordPress uh, exploits and modules uh, coming down the pipe. Um, there's an IP camera uh, credentials gathering and uh, authenticated RCE. If you want to rem remotely execute some code on these, I it's a bunch of IP cameras affected too. Um, MediaWiki uh, remote code execution and QMail as well, which I think is a shell shock uh, variant there. Uh, Brent, did you have anything you wanted to add to the things in the works? Nope. Um, I, I wanted to you know, give give a lot of credit to. Uh, all the guys who worked on Eternal Blue, that's been a kind of a, a multi-week process. And uh, I know Will's been spending a lot of the midnight um, midnight oil to uh, to get that thing uh, ready to go. So um, definitely look forward to it. Um, I think we're, we're hoping to um, see what we can get merged for this release, um, the, the one that's coming up uh, with the pro release this week. 
Um, I also want to kind of point out that um, sometimes when it comes to the things that we work on and the things that are in the works, um, we're driven by a lot of different um, uh, inputs, um, both PM, but also from, our, uh, you know, we're kind of lucky in Metasploit that we have a lot of direct contact with our customers because they are the community uh, as well, people who use Metasploit, our own uh, PSO team and that sort of thing. Um, to give kind of an example, uh, the thing that Lance worked on, the L-Host, uh, as, as an Ethernet um, device rather than as an IP address, that came straight from, from Leon Johnson, um, one of our PSO members. We actually did a shadow for a week, um, uh, basically seeing what they needed from, uh, from an assessment. And um, that, that came up as like, hey, this is actually a problem. You know, when I switch between VMs, I, 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 you know, have, I'd like to have a common setup and not have to tweak it every single time. And so that's, that's where that idea came from. So uh, we're definitely always looking for feedback from uh, the community. Um, and um, if you work at Rapid7, you do count as a community too. Uh, we're, we're definitely welcome, um, you know, input from, from all over. So uh, thanks. Yeah, well said, Brent. Right on. All right. So with that, time for demos. And I may be dating myself here, but this is, uh, anybody know what this is supposed to look like? <laughs> That's like a Commodore 64 demo, isn't it? <laughs> What's that? It, it's not really the content itself. I was just trying to find something from the old demo scene that used to be popular back when computers really sucked. Um, but there we go. Anyway, with that, Failed attempt there. Uh, who, yeah, who would like to go first? Anybody? Any takers for demoing? Going once. I'm going to demo Eternal Blue if I don't get any takers. All right, I'm going to demo Eternal Blue real quick. So I'm going to show uh, this. This is a new. Uh, well, as Brent mentioned earlier, we're hoping to land this um, uh, with the, the release that's going out this week, um, but it's available to anybody who wants to pull the PR from, uh, from GitHub and try it out. Uh, this came in from the community from ZeroSum and Jenna Magius, and uh, it works really well. So what I've got over on the right side of the screen is a Windows 7 VM, um, and make sure the IP address is still the same, yeah. And over here, I've got my, uh, MSF console, and I'm going to use the new Eternal Blue exploit, and I'm there, and I'm going to set the payload to be uh, reverse TCP interpreter, and that's there, and then I set, I'm just using my, my cached uh, commands, obviously set the L host to the IP address of the MSF console system, and set the R host to my Windows system, and then we just run the magic. Cross fingers. The demo got to oh there's a failure, but we can we could still we can recover. Oh can't be, uh, no. this worked like five times in a row this morning. No, I oh sorry. Um, <laughs> gosh darn it. Uh, let's let's let me just try it one more time here since everything everything's queued up. Do what? Do just bleep over that. Yeah, place. exactly. We have the technology. Ultimate in Ultimate in. Service back one. Come on, come on. We'll give another shot here. I had, I had no, no, no. <laughs> and, and is the European version that ships without Internet Explorer and Windows Media Player by default for the oh, wow. for yeah. compliance reasons. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Trust. Exactly. Ah, here we go. Boom. So Win. get UID. Oh yeah, look, I'm system. Sysinfo. Oh. oh look, yeah, I'm on the Windows system. So and that's it. Oh, uh, wow. They did. They did a really nice job with with the with the module, and it's, it should be uh, landing the master pretty pretty darn soon here. So it's over the two, no exactly. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's one and two, but it's not really SMB two at all. So it opens a connection, and almost all of the headers even are nulled out for SMB two. So it really is an SMB two. <laughs> but it uses SMB. Yes. All right. Who's next? Somebody speak up, or I'm just going to hand it off to it's, uh, Brendan. Oh, somebody's popping in here. Sorry, I'm not reading the thing. I lied. Let me return to the VMs. Brendan lied. <laughs> Brent? Go. Yeah. Okay. You want to grab it, or you? Or, or I'd say maybe try to make it the presenter. We'll do the thing. Cool. Ah, see? we see you. All right. Yep. Awesome. All right. A few things I'm going to show off today. Um, one is actually a, a pretty epic pull request. I, I'm only saying epic because it's my own, but uh, I just thought I would point out uh, we, we deleted a lot of code this this sprint, 
and you can see this is a 20, 234,000 line um, delete um, because we, we have uh, a new POSIX interpreter. Uh, in fact, uh, GitHub is unable to show this diff at all. Um, so it was fun to keep it up to date. Um, but, but anyway, um, I've actually been maintaining this for about a year and um, you know, kind of you know, using it as a sort of an incentive to get done with getting everything merged. But um, as of you know, this release, and I think probably the last release, um, you know, Metal is now the new interpreter um, for all of our um, uh, non-Windows systems for, for native mm. stuff. Anyway, yay, fun PR. Um, a little, uh, I think we poured out a little bit um, for the, um, you know, the, 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 the Git history gods, that kind of sort of thing. Um, so something else I'm going to show you guys is uh, a new feature we added to Metal uh, this, this spring around. Um, the idea of being able to background. Um, I believe that we're actually doing some, uh, some, some, some proof of concepts um, dealing with um, kind of social engineering and, and, uh, and Metal running with OS X and, and, and Linux. And one of the things, of course, you might want to do when you have social engineering is to make sure that um, whatever payload you choose to insert um, actually runs in the background and, and can kind of hide itself amongst the, uh, um, the rest of the system processes. Um, currently, Metal always runs in the foreground, and um, we decided to fix that. So I'm going to go ahead and start um, framework here. Um, where did I start? Actually, I've already got it running. Um, so here's framework. I'm basically listening. And uh, so a new feature of Metal, of course, is um, if I run H, you can see I actually have it <laughs> running as Vim. Um, but you now have a, a background feature. Um, so basically what that means is it's going to fork as a service um, or fork as a daemon on um, OS X and Linux and whatever kind of Unix systems it is. And it'll, it should fork as a service um, on Windows systems. Um, that's still um, kind of experimental, um, so I'm not going to demo that right now. But um, but I do have the backgrounding support for uh, Linux systems. And uh, something else that we added also is the ability to override um, binary flags. Um, this is a suggestion from Adam, and the idea here is that um, you can actually build hard-coded configuration options into the payload. But if you're like in an environment and you decide that you need to tweak it um, on, on the fly, you can actually override um, a built-in default with uh, something, an alternate behavior. So um, in the same way that you can also, of course, once you generate a payload, specify like a, a URI or something like that. I'm going to go ahead and point this one to um, localhost. Um, what port 8443? So there we go. You can see it runs, it runs in the background. And oh no, <laughs> something blew up over here. But um, it, it is actually still running in the background. You can see here it's actually you know um, not actually um, visible. Um, if I were to kill it, I could kill them. And uh, he should go away. I'm going to run this guy again. All right, good. We're fine. Um, so that's the backgrounding feature. Um, pretty nifty, especially for um, you know getting things sneakily in. Um, also, some exploits actually need that to avoid, like say, hanging a service or something like that, where we do an injection. So um, look forward to that in the next release. Um, something else I'm going to show here is uh, is Railgun support for Python interpreter. And we actually talked about this a couple of releases ago, where uh, Zero Steiner had worked on adding the Windows equivalent um, to Railgun. If you don't know what Railgun is. It is a, uh, a way to call um, system native APIs over a interpreter session. Um, what that means is, for instance, let's say you had a, a desktop application and it has an API by which you can interact with it. Maybe it's to extract SSH keys or something. Um, you can, uh, over a interpreter session, you can actually call the APIs that are required to get those SSH keys out of the remote system without having to actually re-implement them. It can actually open up C libraries and just call functions. Um, so it's pretty, pretty clever. Um, it's something that we've had in Metasploit for Windows for a long time, but we've never had a way to do it on any other system. Um, this, last, uh, this last release, uh, Zero Steiner basically added support for opening libc, um, glibc, um, on Linux systems, and he added it to Python Interpreter as well. So now Python Interpreter can call native APIs both on Windows and Linux. So now it is actually a cross-platform API. So I'm going to show you guys how that works. Um, so what I've already done is pre-generated a um, Python Interpreter. In this case, I called it um, vi.py, which is a, a pretty cool um, open source uh, Python um, text editor. Um, you should certainly check it out if you like Python. Um, so I'm going to do Python vi.py. Uh, oops, <laughs> I forgot to install Python. That's one <laughs> catch. <laughs> well, I, I, I spun up a fresh VM this morning and um, and thought, well, obviously a fresh VM can't fail, but um, uh, sometimes it can. That's the reason why we also have Metal, so that if you don't have Python, it will work out of the box. So anyway, um, 
and everything just blew up. Uh, let's see. Uh, you know what, um, Pierce, I'm gonna have to actually pause this demo for a second because I, I just realized I did something kind of silly. Um, okay. Is it right if we go ahead and hand it off to, to Brendan if he's ready? Yeah, I'm down with that. Brendan, you ready? Yeah, I'll be able to resume in a second. Sure. Okay, I'll send it over to him. Sweet. All right, you should be the presenter person, Mr. Brendan. So can you see a Linux screen? Very big one, yes. Excellent. Um, so the way I'm going to do this is this takes a little bit of time to run. So I'm going to go ahead and start this demo, then talk about what's going on. <laughs> so you'll just have to trust me for a moment. Uh, this is in Python because, you know, Python is fun. Um, <laughs> it's, we're doing automated <laughs> testing. <laughs> Hey, Maloney is hissing at you. Like a snake. Uh, like it. Yeah, I can, I can see that. Uh, <laughs> sorry, Dave. Um, <laughs> so this is a project to automate testing that is difficult to automate. So in some particular cases, uh, and we'll talk about it, we have lots of payloads, we have lots of machines that we target, and we don't have a whole lot of people to sit there and keep pounding out testing over and over and over again. So the goal behind this was to try and make it easier to automate testing. In this case, I'm gonna launch an automated test uh, against a set of routers that I have here in my uh, home lab. And we're gonna test that Metal works on the routers as well as the uh, Moon exploit for Linksys routers. So I'm just gonna fire it off. Uh, there's a lot of output right now. But in the meantime, I'm gonna kill you with PowerPoint. How's that? Yeah, killing me um, I'm assuming you can see a PowerPoint presentation. Yes. Yes. Excellent. So the, this is made up of two things, VM automation and payload testing. Uh, VM automation is a cheap, cheesy way because I looked at how to interact with VMs on ESXi servers and VMware servers and a couple of other things, and it really sucks. So uh, I wrote a bunch of wrappers behind everything in Python to make it so that I could manage VMs on an ESXi server faster, easier, and better. Uh, that was the gateway to actually accomplishing the payload testing that I needed to do later. So I split them apart because VM automation is kind of awesome, and everybody should probably love that. And I figured maybe if I split them up, somebody else would like the VM automation to be used somewhere else. Uh, the payload testing is the, the, the nuts and bolts behind exactly getting everything up and in a position to do payload testing. Uh, like I talked about, there are about 142 different interpreter payloads. We support dozens of operating systems. Uh, yesterday morning, I got up, and we were playing with Eternal Blue, and I thought, hey, I really would like to help with this. And you saw how, you know, I mean, you've got to set up the VMs and everything else. Well, you know, Eternal Blue allegedly works against all versions of Windows uh, that were not patched in March. Our version doesn't, but it'd be really cool if you could go ahead and test all of those versions of Windows simultaneously. Um, doo -doo -doo. So I demoed this a little bit earlier, and when I demoed it earlier, it was slightly disorganized, um, and there were a couple limitations. First off, only s simple interpreter payloads could be used. Uh, that that is anything with an R host, an L host, R port, L port. Um, it only worked with exploit multi handler. It only used virtual machines. Um, it just grabbed the latest version of Upstream Master, and you could only have one VM for a target or the uh, machine that's attacking. Uh, been a little bit busy. Now, since then, uh, we now have support for cloned ho uh, MSF hosts and targets, so the same uh, test can be split up among multiple VMs to make it go faster and also do a heck of a lot more. Uh, it supports physical targets, as we just saw in the routers. Uh, in theory, it will now support all payloads, um, but I, I, I don't know what all the payloads actually do because there's something like 400 of them. Um, and again, theoretically all exploits, but we run into a problem of having the hardware to test everything. And in theory, again, um, you can line up a ton of ESXi servers or a mix of ESXi servers and uh, VMware workstation things uh, and have them just work, which is really cool. That was an important part to me. Uh, so again, those last three points are all in theory. I haven't actually tested them, 
but it should work. And we all know that if it should work, it will work. Uh, so uh, the old results were kind of simple. Basically, you had a payload, you had the machine that it went against, and whether or not it passed. Uh, the new one allows us to do a lot more tests. Uh, it also allows us to pair an exploit and a payload together. So that's kind of nice. Uh, a, a better view of it here. So we have uh, Windows XP, or sorry, Windows 10 64 bits, uh, the generic Ubuntu host, the exploit used is exploit mult handler, the payload that was used, uh, whether or not it passed. And one of the cool things is when you have this HTML report, which I recognize is not user friendly, the user experience isn't great, but I'm not a web dev. But you can click on the session content and get the entire session generated behind it. So if you wanted to see why it failed, you just click on session content and it shows you the entire session. Um, again, physical host testing, uh, Linksys E1200, Linksys E2500. Uh, the exploit is the moon, which is what we're doing. This is the exact same test I'm running right now. Uh, and we use the MIPS LEM interpreter. Now, how hard is it to use? You just saw the single command line. The hard part here is generating this JSON file, um, which I'm going only going to talk about briefly long enough so that anybody interested will at least understand in the background what's happening. And anybody not interested will have some time to you know, stare at a window for about three minutes. Um, so everybody loves JSON. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm going to actually use an example because yesterday I came in and, hey, we had eternal blue testing and I wanted to help out with the eternal blue testing. So how hard was it for me to create that JSON file to let us do eternal blue testing? Um, honestly, really easy because it was just one exploit uh, and currently it only sports one payload. So all I have to do is come up with the JSON contents, which in this case, this is all pretty much background, the name, the what you want to prefix all your reports with, what branch you want to target in. This is useful, right? Because now uh, I'm happy about this feature because you can target a, a PR uh, automatically. Uh, uh, HTTP port to share payloads on and listeners for your payloads and or exploits. Uh, then you really just have to define the host, which is relatively straightforward. Um, and the advantage is, is you can then hand it a, set, a series of clones of this same VM and it will automatically sp split whatever work it creates among all of those clones. Um, same thing with the targets. Targets and the uh, MSF hosts look just the same. Uh, and it'll also support clones here. Uh, some of these are only needed if you're using you know, a Python payload or a Java payload. Uh, this also supports that if you have a VM with multiple snapshots, you can specify which snapshot you would like to test against. So if you have to have a VM in a specific state to work with something like a configuration, but you don't want to have another VM, just create a snapshot of the state that you want and store it here. It'll automatically set the VM to that snapshot before it starts testing. That then, what are we doing? Uh, you can hand it a list of payloads and a list of exploits. Uh, in this case, it assumes that you have uh, R hosts or L hosts. If there's anything else in there, you can put it into settings. So any setting that you want, you can go ahead and add it, uh, and it'll go ahead and propagate these through all of the VMs that are in the list. And then how do we know it worked? Well, once the session is established, you can give it a list of commands to run. And then you can have a list of how to determine if it was successful. It'll look to see, oh, is this string contained in the session that was generated? If it is, great. Um, and you can have success list be whatever you want. Uh, I had a test that did railgun testing that ran all the railgun commands inside the command list and then checked to see if they actually work. So we were able to test uh, railgun functionality against all the Python payloads in 20 minutes, which was kind of nice. Uh, here are a couple of uh, results from that uh, eternal blue testing. And you can see that it failed on Windows 10 and Windows 8, which was to be expected. It passed only on the Windows versions that have the Windows 7 uh, kernel in it, which the, the, uh, the yeah, the service pack zero, service pack one, yeah, the, the R2. 
because the R0 has Vista as the core. Yeah. Uh, and these are the payloads that I've tested it with, though in theory, again, it should work with all of them. Any questions? It's fantastic work, Brandon. Very much. That's awesome. Yeah, that is pretty <laughs> awesome. All right, and I should be able Brandon, to come back. I actually had a question. Sure. Um, on the uh, on the branches selection, does that uh, rebuild the MSF environment uh, in full, including the bundle, or does it have to be fully compatible with the original master? It, it rebuilds uh, everything. Gems. In fact, it does a it rebases to the the head, basically, or sorry, it resets to head, goes all the way back to the beginning, does a git df, I believe, clears everything out pulls in the new stuff, then does, it actually does a bundle install and, or sorry, gym install bundler, then bundle install, then it runs. Cool, thanks. So yeah, in, in theory, it should, you know, basically just work. It might take a little bit longer, but that means the, the it'll work, it, blah. <laughs> <laughs> It'll take about 10 seconds longer, but it'll work in every scenario. <laughs> that makes sense. Okay. And so here we have, uh, I'm echoing logs back out to the screen, but checking the 1200, it goes through, hey, test passed. Checking 2500, test passed. And we can go ahead and do a quick look. Uh, do, do, do. Failure testing. So right now it just dumps everything into a folder tagged with the name that you gave it for the test and a timestamp. And inside that reports, uh, the metal test, because you probably want to be able to read this. Again, passed, passed. And if you were curious about what the session looked like, you could click on the session. And this gives you the whole session that was generated. Nice. So I'm, I'm going to be working with uh, James to try and figure out how to make this work with Jenkins and our normal test environment so we can start getting automated testing done. Yeah, that's fantastic. That's cool. You you probably try, we can actually parameterize some of the um, PRs coming from the community such that that JSON can be, you know, generated for the most part automatically and then they can put in the blanks or something like that. That would be really nice. Uh, then they can actually, you know, help get us. get all the benefit of yeah. this work. Help us help you. Yes. <laughs> yep. Um, the next steps that I already have in mind right now, it does it works with VM uploading. So using VMware tools, I'd love to have it be able to do an SSH upload uh, to support physical machines or machines that you can't install VMware tools on. Uh, that shouldn't be very hard. Basically, I've modularized uh, how stuff gets there, so you'll just somebody would just have to dump in a new function. Um, I'd like to add back support for VMware Workstation. I'd love to see Fusion supported, so you could actually have this all running self-contained on a on a Mac laptop. But I don't have a Mac, so I'm gonna leave that open. Um, I like Hyper-V. I'd love to see a Hyper-V library, so we could go ahead and have Hyper-V work. Uh, I kind of threw around the idea that we could start a packet capture. So in addition to generating the session data, we could go ahead and have a second button that said download packet capture for that particular uh, session. And so if you really wanted to do some in-depth analysis of, well, why is this failing, you could have the packet capture there too. And uh, I'd love to see this support ops modules. In theory, it, it should be pretty close to supporting it now. And so then we could be able to test uh, payloads, exploits, and aux modules, which is kind of a lot. Wow. Yeah, very cool. So uh, Thank you. Any, any questions? Been busy, man. Good. Good job. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, I kind of feel bad that my name was off that uh, the, the Metasploit uh, list earlier, so I got to fix that. But <laughs> <laughs> we know you're working. It's all good. Uh, uh, on that note, uh, Brent, you want to swing back to you? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. I also don't know if we, if are you, do we have, did anybody else want to present today? I, there was some kind of loose ends, I think, on. 
on some of that, or, or maybe you're gonna you're gonna bring us home, maybe Brent. Uh, I I certainly can if you guys would like. Do it. All right. Uh, if anybody else wants to demo, speak up in the little text chat window, and we'll we'll work it in. But other than that, Brent's taking us home. So so Lance had a fantastic idea while we were debating about the the best way to avoid these kind of issues in the future. The, the big problem I actually had was I, you know, the, the, the standard, uh, I switched to demo mode and all my IP addresses were wrong. And then we thought, well, wait, this is exactly the problem that Leon was having, where every time he switched between VMs, his IP addresses were wrong. So it turns out, yeah, you can actually use the, the new feature where if you set LHost to be an, an internet, an interface, it just magically pulls in whatever the IP address is for that interface. Um, so it works for MSF Venom. So here I'm actually talking to a virtual machine. So I just say lhost equals vbox net zero, which is the interface that um, actually works here. Um, and then over here, I'm just going to, again, set the same thing here for my payload listener and click run. And you see here, it automatically found that vbox net is set to 192.168.6.1. So pretty freaking awesome. Um, so over here, I can just type Python on my thing and I get a session. And I don't even have to care what the IP address is anymore. So uh, FYI for future demo um, god uh, appeasement, um, this will be a really awesome feature. Um, uh, also, probably other uses too. Um, so uh, what I wanted to hear, do here is I'm just going to do a, um, a background um, load path. Uh, was it test modules? And I'm going to use test um, uh, uh, auxiliary. Uh, help me out, Brendan. Um, auxiliary test um, interpreter. Oh shoot, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, Brendan, what was the Rogan um, test module? Post test. Oh, thank you very much. Post test um, interpreter. Actually, let's just do Rogan. Oh no. <laughs> 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 Railgun set session. And, and in case you guys have ever wondered, like, how do I use the most recent session? You can actually do negative one and it will just choose the first thing in the list. So here I can actually run against Linux and ta da, interpreter Railgun works against Linux. Um, there's actually also a, a, a post module we have that, that literally steals all your SSH passwords. It needs a little more features than my VM has at the moment, but um, you can certainly check it out. And if you use GNOME Keyring, um, you might want to sort of rethink your, your choices there, um, at least for storing your secrets. Um, so that's all I have to show right now. Um, uh, if anyone else has anything, um, great. If not, I'll go ahead and close things out. Oh, Egypt says it's the last thing in the list, not the first thing. Um, so, uh, all right, cool. Um, but uh, I guess that's it, Pierce. Awesome. Thanks, Brent. Nice demo. Well, I guess that wraps it up for this week. Uh, thanks, everybody, for participating and for all the demos. A little round of applause for the demos. Yeah. We'll see everybody next time. Thank you. Bye. Bye.